is how to turn a downturn into an upturn by smarter cash flow and profit management. Um, this is a new platform and webinars. So as I said, you all drive the questions. So go ahead and send us any questions you may have via chat. That is the thought bubble icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, so go ahead and start thinking of your questions and send them up. And in the meantime, I will introduce our panelists. Um, first up, we have Mark O'Donnell. Mark is, oh, first of all, I have to say, I've known Mark for 22 years personally. And I was not, <laughs> I was right out of college. It was my first real job. Mark is an amazing person, a mentor. Um, and Mark is, he specializes in working with small businesses in manufacturing, construction, and distribution. And he's a partner at, C at Schmerchel Trelor. We're a full service CPA firm. Um, Mark is an avid cyclist. You may say obsessed. So he loves riding his bike and road cycling. If you don't find him at the office, you can find him on the hills of Wildwood or riding for great causes like Pedal the Cause or the MS-150. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Mark. He's, he loves sports and running and cycling, and that's where you can find him if you don't catch him at the office. Um, next up, we have Fred Kristen. Fred is the co-owner and founder of Hallmark Stone. Hallmark Stone produces countertops for, um, for well, anytime you would go buy a countertop, natural stone or quartz, you'd probably find it at Ikea, Lowe's, Home Depot. They're a manufacturer and wholesaler of all, uh, most of the countertops and basically dominate the market in St. Louis, Kansas City, and Illinois. Um, Doug Jost is, um, Doug Jost is the Chief Technology Officer over at Jost Chemical. Jost, uh, Jost has been a chemical, or excuse me, Jost has been a client of ours, of Mark O'Donnell's, probably since his Doug's dad, Jerry, founded the company in 1985. I believe Mark has known him that long. Um, Doug has been working at Jost, uh, obviously it's his dad's company, for at least 20 years um, in several different positions. Um, he's, now he's the, the chief technology officer. He has an EMBA from Wash U and a chemical engineering degree. So Doug is, is able to answer any questions you may have um, based on the company, because he's been there, been there so long, he's, he's really, you know, knows a lot about it, obviously. Um, Doug and his wife have a celebrity pet. <laughs> Their cat, Peaches, was a finalist in the Purina Pet Parade. So that's kind of fun. Oh, I wanted to say something about Fred, too. I forgot about Fred. Fred, he, he has two kids who are into lacrosse. Um, the, his son is in lacrosse and hockey, and he, he enjoys watching sports and driving them to and from their events. His daughter's in tennis and lacrosse. And now we're moving over to Christina Anderson. She's the VP at Enterprise Bank out of Kansas City. She is an avid gardener and loves to travel, and right now she's into kayaking. She's loved, she has a passion about um, urban gardening and growing her own food. She's excellent at cash flow and cash flow process. She's well-versed in banking and finance and any questions you may have in that area. So um, let's just go ahead and get started while we're waiting on some questions in chat. Um, so we'll start with Mark. Mark is our anchor panelist. Mark, you have a unique point of view on cash flow cycle. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mark, I think you're muted. There we go. Or not. Jake, can you mm -hmm. have unmute? Oh, there we Mark, go. Mark, I have muted you. All right, thank you. <laughs> so talking well, I'm in the show. generation that technology doesn't come easily. Uh, there is an area I do not have a unique point of view, by the way. So. You know, just to kind of get a common ground and, and keep it relatively simple, I have kind of a simplified 500 foot flyover of a dollar as it moves through the cash flow cycle. So if you think it starts in cash, the first stop is clearly inventory. 
where operations combines the material, labor, and supplies, et cetera, as it moves from raw material to finished goods, accumulating dollars all the way. So we have some investment right out of the bat when we start to move it from cash to inventory. Hopefully, it doesn't spend a lot of time there. And as a result of the efforts of our sales and marketing teams, our material and labor dollars, plus our gross profit, move from inventory to accounts receivable. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then final result of collection policies and procedures, our dollars find their way back home, cash. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, it, it's very simplistic. If you think about just the dollar moving from the cash account to inventory to receivables back to cash. It's obviously a lot more detailed than that, but it's a framework. Uh, these fundamental kind of operational elements of a cash flow cycle are measured by management, in particular by accountants, in either days or dollars. Now, for this example, I'll use dollars because it's more on point for this discussion. So at any point in time, we can measure dollars invested in the cash flow cycle. That's the process of going from cash to, to inventory to receivables back to cash by adding our inventory dollars and our accounts receivable dollars. So as an example, if we have 45,000 in um, inventory and 125,000 in accounts receivable, we have $170,000 invested in the asset portion of our cash flow cycle. So we do have an offset there because clearly some of the items we've purchased, we haven't paid for yet. Those are sitting over there in accounts payable. We haven't written a check for them yet. Uh, again, you can easily measure that in dollars by uh, looking at your accounts payable for inventory and related items. So you would subtract that to get the amount of, of cash invested in the operating cycle. 170,000 from above minus say $30,000 for accounts payable would indicate you have $140,000 invested in your cash flow cycle. Um, I guess there's a two key points there is there is an impact on cash flow by managing these items. And that impact will be the net change of the amount you have invested over a given period of time. So by managing these items, as example, if your net investment goes from 140,000 to 160,000, you effectively used $20,000 of your cash by investing it in your operating cycle. That's probably not something you want to do as we move through the next six or eight months, if it can be helped. Uh, so like a lot of things that I do in my line of work as an accountant, we measure. We measure results. Well, cash flow in of itself is kind of a result. Uh, you know, it's driven by those underlying um, factors, um, you know, by operations, how much inventory they're making of what part, um, how fast those items are being made, what kind of labor dollars are going into those items while they're there. And it's impacted by what our gross margins are. It's impacted by our billing practices, our collection policies and procedures, and obviously offset by our accounts payable policies and procedures. So when we start to talk about cash flow and managing it, it is good to measure the result of it. That's how we manage our businesses. But to get to the heart of it, you have to look at these, op what I'm gonna call operational items. Now, those operational items don't include at least two important things. One of which is the purchase of property, plant, and equipment, and debt and debt service. Uh, you know, those are typically the result of overt decisions by management um, of significance, they tend to be um, from time to time, not a daily and, uh, if you will, liquid sort of uh, decision. Uh, the key there, of course, is timing. And obviously, as we go into a downturn, it's not a great time to be investing in property, plant, equipment. Uh, and if at all possible, you want to minimize the use of debt. But, but again, as we look at this process, again, from a very simplified point of view, we measure what we have invested 
in the cash flow cycle, and then look at those underlying processes that get the result of where we're at today. Um, easiest way to monitor it is at any point in time, the amount of cash we have invested in the operating cash cycle go up or go down. Um, ideally, it would stay about the same. Um, I am certain that our two panelists could give you a lot, a lot better practical insights on how to do that. So, Marianne, um, back to you. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. <laughs> I'm having issues with technology over here too. Um, so, thank you, Mark, for that, and thank you for simplifying that complicated process. Um, Doug, do you have anything to add about cash flow at Jost? Um, sure. Actually, there's one thing I would uh, disagree a little bit with Mark on in terms of, um, you know, investing in the downturn. Ideally, you know, if you save money when things are good, then you can take advantage of um, situations when things are bad. And so since Joe's Chemical has been a traditionally conservative um, borrower, you know, our debt to equity has been less than one traditionally. And we are borrowing from a bank currently, but we can easily pay it off through related uh, parties. So. Um, then we're just beholding to ourselves. And so now, you know, we're looking to take advantage of um, situations in terms of growing new products, um, looking for real estate and other things where others are having to sell because they were, were um, taking on too much debt before. So with regards to that. And then with regards to um, inventory that Mark was talking about, I've always been pushing for trying to have lower inventory at least we've been keeping it constant and our revenue actually has been growing. We're up about 15 or 16%, um, fortunately, uh, because some of our products are used um, in COVID related um, uh, products. We make products for um, COVID test kits and also for uh, the COVID vaccine. And then some of our products are used in cold remedies that have also increased in business. Um, and let's see. And then we've been working on launching um, new products. So uh, we patented three new products so far, and we're on track to launch about 10 new products. So um, while this is a, um, you know, a, a bad short-term situation, we're still looking long-term to be able to help uh, continue to grow the company. Hopefully, uh, it, does that answer your question or do you have more follow-up for that? That's awesome. I, I love the idea that you guys are into all, you know, helping with the COVID vaccine. And I mean, that's, that's huge. I, I actually didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, Fred, do you have, or Mark, do you want to go back and, wait, is Mark muted? Mark, you're muted again. Am I still muted? Yeah, I know. You're good. You're good. I, you know, I think uh, Doug's point well taken that, you know, if you go into a downturn and you're economically strong, that's clearly an advantage, both competitively and, uh, if you will, in terms of the timing of purchasing items that, you know, from other manufacturers or maybe people who have gone out of business at a huge discount. Um, and he's right. Uh, Joe's Chemical has been a very conservative company. Uh, they, they've managed their company that way. Uh, not all companies are that way, uh, but he's correct. I mean, if you have a, if you will, a cash hoard, it's a great time to have one because you can really get some bargains. Uh, needless to say, at the same time, you don't want your current cash flow to hurt, but he's right, there's no doubt. That's great. Thanks, Mark. Fred, do you want to talk about cash flow over at Hallmark Stone? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the um, some some practical ways as far as I, I kind of took some notes down about the different steps uh, that uh, um, Mark was talking about the cash flow cycle. I think the key is breaking down those steps and looking at each uh, each uh, step and figuring out specific ways that are truly going to hit the bottom line. For instance, you talk about from uh, going from uh, cash to inventory. Um, what are some real real practical ways you can do that. And then uh, a couple things you can do is everybody always looks at, okay, how do we lower the cost of our inventory um, through negotiations or buying in bulk and something. And sometimes it's not uh, it's not buying in bulk that actually 
ends up saving you the most money. Sometimes it's buying in smaller quantities. We have uh, on Stone regular de deliveries. We have five delivery. Uh, we have several companies that deliver every day of the week. Um, Build our slabs here every day of the week. Uh, what that does, allows me to do is it allows me to take delivery the day before or the day of that I'm going to cut that stone. So as far as my uh, cast cycle, that allows me then to have the job fabricated and installed um, and already and sometimes uh, collected um, before I'm paying that invoice. Uh, 30 days to, to 60 days later, I have different terms with different vendors. Um, so by taking those five-day deliveries, uh, we may have sacrificed a little bit on uh, some of the quantity discounts, but the, the other cost that we save there is one, uh, uh, we've reduced uh, um, our carrying cost here. We've reduced the space that's required to store the stone, which is also another expense related to it. Um, and uh, it's uh, shortened our cash flow cycle. Um, some of the other things we've done is, uh, uh, when I look at, uh, Mark also went through and talked about the labor and technology. And so one of the big things we do is we just, we've really decreased our production time. Uh, so for builders, uh, we produce countertops from the time we measure, we produce and install them in five days. And for other customers, it's seven days. Um, and we're trying to get that down. We're always trying to get that down even shorter. Uh, because the faster from the time we take an order to the time we complete the order means that I can collect that money faster. And then the final thing on the back end is just uh, um, on receivables. Um, in receivables, the, the key is uh, the squeaky wheel gets attention. And not that I want to be a pain to my, my good customers or anything, but I, I want to stay up on the payables. I don't want to lose sight of the payables. And next thing you know, you have a payable that's uh, uh, 60, 90 days past due, 120 days past due, and now you're battling to uh, collect that money. What we found is if we're very consistent in the timeliness of our phone calls regarding payables, at certain intervals, we automatically make phone calls, uh, just as nice reminders to say, hey, uh, I'll just say, uh, we're just checking in with you. Your payment was due on Friday. Um, uh, give us a holler and just let us know what the status is. Um, over years, um, the payables uh, uh, folks that uh, that work with us know we're going to be the one that calls. Okay? They, and uh, if you're a, uh, an accountant or uh, and, and payables, you just don't want those calls. You just don't want to have to respond to those calls and do it. So I know if uh, anybody here that signs checks, there's there's certain checks that you make sure they get out get paid quicker, so you don't have to deal with it. So we don't want to be a pain, but at the same time, especially in this economic situation where people are at times are struggling, um, businesses are struggling, uh, we just want our, our um, customers to understand we're on top of it and we're looking at it and we're expecting payment when payment is due and, and we're going to follow up with that very quickly within a week if it's not. Um, and that's uh, really reduced our receivables uh, in terms of hundreds of thousands of decreasing it by hundreds of thousands of dollars and also making our receivables of the term very short. And now I'm muted. Oh my goodness, thank you, Fred. Thank you for all of that. Um, Christina, do you wanna add anything from a bank perspective? I just think from a bank perspective, we're always thinking about, um, we're trying to help clients um, figure out their cash flow days and reduce that number. And so, yes, we offer services and products that help them do that. However, if they're already, especially in this climate, if they're monitoring that regularly, it's a lot easier. Um, so it's really the combination of what Fred and Doug just said. It's a lot easier in a downturn because you've been conservative then to be able to invest and be in other areas, other new products, new services, and expand um, in different areas, it's a lot easier to do that when you're managing, you know, um, that cycle very well. So um, I would agree with both. And I think it's from a banker's perspective, that's what we want to see. Thank you, Christina. And I just noticed we actually have a question here in chat. Mark, this is from Rob Rules. 
um, it actually says, Mark, you suggest not putting money into building, but if I need some repairs, is it possible to get more value for my cash than I would in a good time? Well, um, first of all, am I on? Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, the thing about repairs is, uh, for many of those, you really don't have a choice because if you don't, at least in my world, if I don't fix something, it continues to get worse. So that would be hard. Clearly, if it's really bad, if you got a flood coming in every time it rains, that's really not a choice. Um, so you know, the, the the difficulty I think we're looking at right now is we're not in any kind of historic cycle that we have a good feeling about. Um, you know, we've all been through recessions, uh, well at least. Those of us for the few years have been through recessions and downturns, and you know we get a feeling for how long they might last. Uh, the problem with COVID is we not only don't know how long it will last, but how deep it will go. And um, you know it's that something of a cliche: businesses don't go out of business because they run out of income; they go out of business because they run out of cash. So. You know, that what you're talking about is really a tightrope, and I appreciate the question and the difficulty it can be to answer it. You know, do I fix this? You know, assuming it's a significant amount of money, if I've spent 10 grand to fix this, or should I hold on to my 10 grand, maybe do a $2,000 patch, save the eight grand in case I need it for later? That's a tough call. And for now, in particular, because we don't know, let's face it, until we get a vaccine, there's going to be no clear way out of this mess. And depending on who you listen to, that vaccine could be three months off or 12 months off. Well, you just have to function on how much cash you have today. Tough question, but a great question. And Mark, I'll add to that. Uh, the one thing I would tell you, though, is the construction um, trades are all uh, fairly busy. Um, so as far as trying to negotiate the discounted rates or something like that, the with people in the uh, construction trades right now, it would probably be very, very difficult to do that. Doug, do you want to add anything to that? I saw you nodding your head at the vaccines a year off. You're muted, to, oh yeah. Sure. So, based on clinical trials, it takes at least a year to get approval. So, you know, they, I think Trump just uh, gave half a billion dollars to a company that had a vaccine uh, ready to go. And so, you know, that would be a year from now when they would be approved. And then they also have to actually create the vaccine. So say they have 100 million vaccines, well, that doesn't quite cover everyone. So, so now, you know, depending on herd immunity, you might, if this actually works for the COVID vaccine, you need about 60 or 70% of people uh, with herd immunity. So, um, you know, I figure it would probably be a year, a year and a half before um, that happens. Um, and that's why you're starting to see the cases rise. The deaths haven't really increased that much because I think it's still it's a fraction of a percent. And so, um, you know, this is something we can talk about later, but, you know, the, the risk versus reward um, of this situation and how people are handling it differently, you know, whether it's a government or business. And it's just, it's very interesting to see. Um, and I'm sure a lot of business schools will be talking about the situation of, how should have this been handled? How should a company or a government handle this? And and uh, anyway, it's, uh, we're just trying to make do as best we can. So. so it'll be a great case study for 20 years from now. Well, a couple years from now, probably. <laughs> okay, so I have another question in here from Ryan. What are effective ways to mitigate raw material costs to improve cash flow? Who wants to take that? Doug? <laughs> sure, I guess I'll take that. So I've always been pushing for um, reducing the cycle of putting cash in and then getting cash out. And uh, some of my coworkers don't necessarily agree with me, but um, you know, like our our inventory, total inventory, finished goods, the raw materials and work in progress is about, um, say 120 days. And it's been actually decreasing because our revenue has been increasing while we've been holding inventory uh, constant. And so 
Um, I think we could do a lot better than that, but that has bought us some cushion. Um, but when you hold that much inventory, you know, you're paying for cost to store it. Um, you don't have money in the bank to um, deal with uh, your cash flow needs. And like Mark mentioned, you can go out of business if you don't have the cash to pay the bills. And so, you know, you're not getting that inventory um, turning and making money. Um, to me, that's a, a problem. So uh, now, I mean, there could be situations where all of a sudden you get the surge in orders like toilet paper and you didn't have the toilet paper. But um, I think in most cases, uh, you're willing to give up some gain and uh, or having some flexibility by having uh, some more cash. And so uh, anyway, I, I, I believe in trying to uh, reduce your cycle time as much as possible. And, you know, there's some companies that have been hurting because they uh, maybe were too lean and they didn't have uh, uh, some inventory coming in, especially if they were reliant on other countries like China. So we've gotten a lot of business from companies that normally don't buy from us because they couldn't get their supply and they had to come to us. And so uh, um, now we realize that's a temporary situation possibly, but, you know, the government and, and China are not getting along very well. And so it could be that this may be long term where, the U.S. starts trying to buy uh, more domestically, but I think in the long term, people will look to continue to buy low cost, and so um, I feel that's still a temporary situation. Thanks, Doug. Fred, do you want to add anything to that about ways to mitigate raw material costs and improve cash flow? Um, yeah, I think Doug, Doug, I agree with everything Doug said, and I, I, it's interesting because the China situation has impacted uh, our product line too uh, uh, increased. There've been quite a few tariffs that have been uh, passed for its imports from China, um, and uh, um, I think that's kind of a uh, just something that's up in the air and it's going to be uh, up in the air for a while to figure out before that uh, steadies itself and uh, people uh, have a reliable uh, um, channels from overseas. Um, but I, I do think it's a temporary situation. I think uh, what we've seen in our market is uh, um, very quickly within a matter of six months, um, manufacturers can pop up in other countries uh, to supplant the, time, the shortage from China. We've seen uh, imports from uh, Korea grow, imports from India grow, um, and imports from uh, Europe grow. Um, but at the same time, now there's uh, New uh, obstacles uh, with new tariffs going, uh, look, being looking at uh, towards uh, Europe and stuff like that. So, uh, but the, the real key, I think, for uh, with your inventory is looking at inventory very specifically. Um, not only the way you purchase the inventory, but if you have aged inventory, um, is there uh, opportunities to convert that aged inventory into cash? Um, sitting with a bunch of stuff in your warehouse that's uh, um, sitting on your balance sheet, but that's not generating cash is, is uh, um, not something you want to have. So we constantly look at our, our inventory, um, slow moving inventory, um, inventory that's just stale and uh, search for different ways to move that inventory and uh, produce product with it, uh, to convert that to cash. Great, thanks, Brad. Um so we have another question here in the chat. Oh, sorry, hold on, let me get to this really quick. So um, Fred, your company's end users include individuals improving their homes. Have the local restrictions affected your product installations? Uh, luckily for us, uh, construction was deemed a central uh, um, enterprise. And I would tell you, if you have to deal with uh, Someone who doesn't have a uh, kitchen sink during these times, it, it, it does become very essential. So uh, we have um, we really not slowed down at all due to this. We have had individual customers who have delayed their product, their projects, um, uh, whether uh, they have a sick uh, family member or um, they're just nervous. But in general, we've seen a big spike um, in the uh, demand uh, for remodeling and, and, and uh, countertops. Um, we have taken uh, very strong precautions, though, going into uh, homes. Uh, the day, two or three days before, we quit, we go over the questions that we're going to be asking the customer. We go out over those questions, the same questions that we all have kind of seen about uh, being exposed and so forth. We go over those the night before, 
uh, with the customer. The installers go over those again with the customer on the way to the, to the job site, and they actually ask the customer to just uh, greet them at the door and then please leave the, uh, the area that we're going to be working for the entire time we're at the job site. Um, we go into the house with bleach and water, and we disinfect the uh, area that we're going to work in. We install the countertops. We disinfect again before we leave. And then when we are outside, uh, we call the customer uh, and have them walk through their kitchen, um, either FaceTime or um, just walk through their kitchen and kind of uh, uh, remotely have them uh, check everything out. Um, the goal is that we are not face-to-face -face with the um, other than through a doorway with a with a customer at all. We've asked the customers to please not enter the kitchen, not enter the work area while we're working. Um, and it's been working out pretty good. On a couple of occasions, we've had people call us uh, and uh, our installers have been nervous about entering a home. Um, so we've actually contracted out with the cleaning service to, to show up uh, uh, an hour before we show up and, and clean everything and disinfect everything uh, thoroughly. And then um, we've gone and installed the uh, countertops and uh, um, and then um, uh, disinfecting them again before we've left. So the main thing with that is it's giving the customers confidence, but it's also giving our installers confidence uh, that we're taking their safety very, very, um, making that very important for us. And it's worked really well. Wow. That's great. I mean, that's great that you guys are so thorough and then you clean and clean before and after. I mean, but I guess you have to do that now, but that's, that's great. That's really, it makes me comfortable. You know, <clears throat> I didn't even want the charter guy to come in our house. I made my husband go get all the stuff and do it himself. Um, but I would be comfortable with that. So thanks, Fred. Um, we have another question here in the chat, um, a follow-up. Where, okay, let's see, where inventory resources are scarce, what is the right amount of inventory to carry, and what is the best inventory accounting system to utilize during the COVID crisis? Um, LIFO or FIFO, does it make sense to switch? Doug, do you know anything about that? or? Sure, I can speak to that. <laughs> So when the inventory is scarce, that means the pricing is volatile. So um, ideally, if this historically was a, a scarce item, what you would want to do is um, form an agreement with your customer that they would agree to a certain price for a period of time, and then you would lock in the supply with your raw material supplier. Now, in this situation where this kind of just uh, came upon us, uh, let's just talk about toilet paper, right? That no one thought they're going to have to stockpile toilet paper, and all of a sudden you go to the store and you can't find it. Um, you know, then the question is, well, can you use a substitute like newspaper, right? I mean, is there something else that you could use uh, to make your product that uh, um, doesn't require that uh, that raw material? And that's easier said than done. It might not be, but like for example, there's some customers that want um, a particular salt, and so we try to guide them to a different salt. Well. This one is uh, slow for us to make. Um, we have some, uh, we don't have inventory of this, but we could make this other one, you know, would this uh, work for you? And in some cases it can, in some cases it can't, but at least we try to see if we can um, guide them to a different substitute. And uh, um, I don't know, you just kind of have to try to manage the best you can because you may not have the equipment to generate the product, you may not have um, the raw material to make it. Um, but my thought is, well, Instead of just shutting down, how how can you uh, how can you work around the problem? Now I muted myself again. Fred, can you add anything to that about raw materials? Um, no, I, I think I think. Uh, Doug, you had some really good points there. I think uh, one of the things we do occasionally is try to substitute uh, um, working with the customer to find uh, something very similar as far as uh, aesthetically, but something that's available. So with our suppliers that we know uh, are having challenges uh, meeting demand or having challenges with lead time and so forth, um, we will go back to those customers right at the very, very beginning and let them know about the challenges and then give them opportunities to uh, uh, switch products. Uh, generally, we try not to do that because we want to support all of our suppliers, but uh, um, 
in a situation that uh, um, is going to have somebody be without a, a kitchen for an extended period of time. Um, we have kind of uh, uh, really spent a lot of time uh, being able to cross reference different colors and different styles and so forth so that we know uh, quite a few different options uh, if one particular product is uh, delayed. Thank you, Fred. Um, Christina, we actually have a banking question here. What are your thoughts on applying for forgiveness on PPP loans, and are you seeing people taking out larger lines of credit? So I'll take the second one first. Um, we, you know, we're constantly getting updates in terms of um, internally how people are um, the 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 large number of PPP clients that we now have or new clients as a result of PPP, and then also our existing relationships, if they're increasing their line, and we, we really haven't seen that. Um, we haven't seen, we have seen a reduction in um, the usage of lines. I will say, I'll speak specifically for um, just regionally, and I, I would venture to say that that's probably um, what you're going to find uh, generally for the banks. Don't quote me on that. But I will say that right now, you know, while there was this rush, you know, in the process of uh, PPP in April to actually get that line of credit along with PPP, we've seen a lot less of that. That drastically went down, the conversations, the interest, and also the usage. Um, the usage of existing lines and the request for new lines. And so um, PPP forgiveness. So the first question is that really, uh, I would highly suggest that if you're, if you are not having conversations with your accountant about the forgiveness piece do, but also the SBA's website is the place that honestly, we get a lot of our information from there as well. Unfortunately, I don't have any news. <laughs> that's really been the uh, that's been the 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 response since the beginning of, of all of this since, since April. So the delay in response, and so we're really just at the the mercy of once the the government figures out what they're going to do, once certain um, measures get passed in Congress, once the SBA figures out how. They want the banks to really implement this process of forgiveness. If there, if there is forgiveness for the whole thing under a certain amount, we'll see what that is. But um, I don't have a solid answer on, on that front. Thank you, Christina. Um, we have another question in here. I'm making sure I'm not, not muted again. Um, another question here for Fred. Um, Lowe's and Home Depot are your intermediary customers. Have either of those companies slowed payments? Um, no, actually, uh, uh, they actually uh, increased the speed of their payments. Um, um, Home Depot did at the very beginning of this just slightly. Uh, I think it realized it had some uh, smaller vendors across the country that uh, were struggling. Um, but uh, traditionally, both of those companies are have implemented a uh, kind of a quick pay system. Normally, you'll get paid within uh, 15 days uh, from either of those. Those are two of my um, larger customers, and they together represent about 40% of my business. But we have about 155 kitchen and bath shops that we service, um, and those are the ones that uh, the smaller businesses are the ones that we uh, really watch and, and really look for. And I think just because of the added attention we put on this. In fact, I, I, I personally get the receivables report, a, a report with the status updates uh, every Friday afternoon, and I go through the entire thing uh, myself um, and uh, put follow-up questions and so forth. Um, I think when we've increased uh, awareness with our sales staff and with our, um, our customer service staff and with our clients, um, uh, like I said, we, they, they know we're paying close attention to it, and so far we've had we've been able to mitigate any uh, increase in our receivables. Great, thank you. Um, we have another one here for Doug. Doug, your company sells both domestically and internationally. Can you talk about the difference in demands in each market since pre-COVID? 
have the customer payment practices changed? Um, we have historically been growing more um, internationally, and that's why we built a factory actually in Poland. And fortunately, the factory was just built right before COVID happened. But um, it was not operational yet, and we were hoping to get a, a uh, working permit by March. And because of COVID and the Polish government slow anyway, you know, it's uh, now pushed out to hopefully next month, and then we'll be able to start selling product. We had to validate our production lines anyway, so we didn't lose that much time. But um, having a huge investment there, not able to make money, is problematic. And that goes back to being a conservative investor we're a, or lender, I mean. Um, we could handle uh, this uh, leech on us until it can start making money, right? If you were fully um, maxed out on your debt and you built this factory uh, looking to maximize your profit, well, it could have been that uh, we would have suffered because we wouldn't have been able to carry this plant not making any money. Um, uh, fortunately, our customers have been pretty good at paying us. I think 90% are on time, but not to say accounting and and uh, sales support don't keep after our customers to uh, pay on time. But fortunately, you know, our, a lot of our customers are nutrition, food, pharmaceuticals, and so um, people need that whether there's good times or bad times. So, um, in that way, we're a little bit resilient to uh, some of these market fluctuations. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, so this is a question for both Fred and Doug. Assuming we do not get a vaccine for six months or more, which we don't think we will, what impact will COVID have over that period of time on your business? How are you reacting? And kind of how are you taking care of employees as well? I mean, are they remote or you can kind of pick what part you want to answer first. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, Fred, there you go. You're, you're, you're good. Okay. Um, as far as uh, at the, a few weeks ago, we were probably 60 to 70% of our uh, office people were uh, working from home. We gave uh, and we continue to give them an option um, when uh, most businesses kind of reopened. Uh, most of our um, employees came back and decided to work from the office. Um, they still have that option uh, to return from home. Um, uh, but uh, it was interesting. I really didn't think, I really thought more people would uh, um, uh, prefer not to see my face on a daily basis. But uh, um, <laughs> I think they, uh, it, it's the companionship and it's also um, uh, distractions at home and different things. I think people, want to be out and about, they, they want to be around other people. Um, we have taken precautions as far as wearing masks and stuff when our customers come into our showroom. We have, have them uh, call before they actually come in the door and so that the person that's going to be working with them greets them right at the door and, and kind of controls the situation right there. Uh, we put in uh, um, different entrances and exits for installers and shop people and so forth so that uh, not everybody in the company is going to the front uh, office. Um, and then we've uh, uh, just tried to constantly remind people about uh, wearing their mask and, um, and, and uh, uh, social distancing and those kind of things, uh, um, talking to installers and reminding them on a every few day basis about making sure they're doing, can do, continuing to do the cleaning and doing the things that we need to do. Uh, just keeping it in their mind, but not, not, not beating it into their mind, but just keeping it into their mind. Um, and uh, so far it seems to be working okay. Thanks, Fred. Doug, what about you over at Joost? Sure, uh, we've done quite a few things. Um, so, for example, back to a previous question about uh, scarcity of um, uh, getting raw materials. So we also had difficulty getting sanitizer. So we, we're a chemical company, so we can make our own sanitizer. So we did that to put for all the buildings so people could um, wash their hands or clean um, the surfaces. Uh, we have uh, two nurses that are here, um, um, one at each, uh, a manufacturing building to test each employee for signs of uh, COVID. Um, we uh, require people to um, wear masks when they're not, um, uh, when they're in close proximity to each other. You know, just in the case of how we manufacture, a lot of our employees are wearing masks anyway when manufacturing products. So, uh, but it, with regards to office people, um, 
you know, some people are more scared than others, but at least in the office area, um, we, we've issued masks to everyone and um, people are uh, required to wear masks when um, within like six feet of each other. Um, another thing, when there was a lot of fear, especially at the beginning of this, we decided to offer a 15% bonus to our employees to come to work um, as long as they were not sick. And so that really improved morale. And uh, we did have um, two cases of where people, uh, two employees had COVID um, at different times. Uh, they were quarantined and the people around them um, were quarantined and we've not had really uh, much issue with regards to uh, that. And let's see. Um, I, uh, with regards to our business, um, some of our products uh, are COVID related, like I mentioned before. And so as this continues on, I think we'll have some uh, business growth uh, due to this. And uh, unfortunately though, with some of our new products, a lot of our customers have shut down their R&D. Uh, and so we can't really get our new products into uh, our customers' new products until they can start working with them. So we're, however, we're building these up. So once all this um, is done, we'll be able to uh, uh, launch these new products and be able to continue uh, growing. And so uh, anyway, hopefully that answers the question. That's great, thank you. I had no idea. We should have come to you when we were all out of sanitizer. <laughs> now I know. Um, okay, we have another question here from Danny to all the panelists. Where should companies be looking internally to find, okay, hang on a second, oh, messed up my window. Sorry, where should companies be looking internally to find immediate cost savings to increase the cash on hand? Doug, do you want to take that and then we'll have questions? Sure. Well, one thing, you know, when I first started as a production engineer, I was looking at our utility bills and I noticed that there was these gross receipt taxes. And I was like, what is that? And it turns out, you know, in Bellridge, uh, these utilities were getting confused and they were charging us taxes from Charlac or St. John or whatever. And th these taxes were significant. I think I paid for myself that year. I don't know about since then, but, you know, we got like $50,000 um, in taxes back. And so, you know, one thing I would do is just check even your bills. Are you being charged appropriately for, for certain things or is there some incorrect um, uh, billing? And then other things, you know, can you reduce water usage, electric usage? Uh, you can even get incentives from Ameren and Ameren will help you with uh, some of those things. And so, um, you know, those are things that will pay uh, long-term if you can, uh, you know, reduce your water and electrical costs. Another thing, you know, does your business need the real estate if people are successfully operating from home? Uh, you know, should you uh, allow them to work from home or maybe you have a space where they can come in and, and work uh, when they need to, to come in to work and then, and then go back home? You may want to look at your business model and see, do your employees actually have to uh, come in to work uh, successfully? I think there is a lot of benefit from having people together, but maybe they don't have to be uh, together all week, maybe just, you know, in a conference room, uh, you know, a couple times a week or something. And so that could save you a lot on, on rent and costs and things like that. So um, something to think about. Thanks, Doug. Fred, do you want to weigh in on this? Um, uh, from a cost savings perspective, I think one of the things is, is to know every line item, every account that you have, every check that you're spending um, as a CFO or who's ever a controller or the owner of the company um, should understand exactly everything that a check is being written for, um, and has that uh, is there somebody whose responsibility it is uh, on each and every check to um, to understand what's being spent and to ensure that you are um, spending that money properly, um, uh, getting you the best service or the best pricing or uh, the frequency and, and just really understanding and scrutinizing all the costs. I think uh, I've seen at times in the past where I was a consultant for 10 years before I, I 20 years ago, and I saw plenty of times where people would enter contracts and they would renew contracts and they really had not scrutinized every single line uh, and every single expense. And uh, you have to be able to. Uh, you have to be able to get into the minutiae and to the details if you're going to really want to save uh, uh, reduce expense. There's no there's no big broad sweeping thing that you can do. You have to really go uh, item by item, line by line, um, and you 
and you have to understand put in systems to that uh, all the time. That's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Oh, Marianne, can I add to that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So from a banking perspective, I will say that um, the conversations I'm having right now are, have you reviewed your credit card processing system? Have you reviewed your fees for any retirement plans that you offer? Um, has there been a review of your utilities? You know, any system that support um, your business operations. Um, credit and debit card is a huge one because everyone's processing using that. There has been a huge shift from using, from sending invoices in the mail. That's, that's gone down. Now people are receiving them via QuickBooks much more than they were pre-COVID even. So um, it, there are specific areas when I look at a bank, at a bank statements for a new concrete business that I have. And I say you're you're using your debit card for these transactions. Have you considered using a credit card that gets cash rewards? Since you've got the um, the cash over your expenses in order to pay for those credit card transactions, it's kind of just thinking through those different every single item that you have and things that may seem oh I can't save any money there. I would say reevaluate everything at this point. Great. Thanks, Christina. Doug, Doug, did you have your hand up? Yeah, from what Christina said, it um, jogged something in my mind. Another thing to think about is to rank all your customers ABC on how quick they pay, and then um, and then tell your customer, hey, if you pay us quicker, we'll uh, put you in line faster to get product, because there's some customers that want you to use their line of credit to pay out like 90, 180 days or something like that. And, I would start classifying those as not your friend. You know, they're abusing you, uh, using you as a bank. And so my, my thought is um, you need to try to check them and say, hey, that's not right. We're not in the business of banking. We're in the business of selling you a product. And so, you know, those customers that are willing to pay you faster, you know, I would rank them higher, especially now when you're short on cash. Thanks, Doug. Okay, we've got three questions. Um, Let's see, this one, this one's similar to, I think, of where we've kind of been before, but let me try this again. For manufacturers ordering goods and materials from Europe or China, are there any specific INCO terms? Example, X Works, free alongside ship, cost and freight, delivered at place cost insurance and freight that you feel are best for preserving and managing cash? What do you think about that, Doug? You deal overseas. Oh, I think you're muted. Does that make sense? Oh, wait, you're muted, Doug. Hold on. Uh, one oh. second. I was just uh, oh, yeah, trying reading to it? read the question here. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. Well, you know, if... If you pay for all the uh, delivery, it's possible that you could get a lower cost, but then you have to handle all the risks of, you know, it doesn't get delivered to the right place, the, the delivery thing, someone steals your delivery or something. Whereas if it's all paid for, then your raw material supplier has to deal with that. And so, you know, it's kind of a risk reward thing. Um, um, you know, one thing I would look at is look at where all your suppliers are and, and look at the situation. Like if, your suppliers are in China, maybe you need to relocate them to uh, places that are uh, more reliable, um, or at least in a short-term situation to be able to do that. So you'll be able to continue to uh, make product. And uh, I mean, the other thing you could work with the manufacturer to see if they would be willing to store inventory in the United States at their own warehouse. And so you don't have to store it, they, they take that uh, storage on. And so then that may help with uh, reducing the, the cost and risk for you. Um, of course, they'll charge you for that, but it could be they can use that inventory for other customers too. So um, it's something to uh, to think about. Okay, thanks, Doug. Okay, so let's go to the next one here. We've only got four minutes left. Do you have a sales forecast? You have a sales forecast to help you plan your cash flow. What is your horizon? Oh, what is on your horizon, and how often do you update it? And he says, "Great discussion. Thanks." This is from Bill. 
Um, Fred, do you want to jump in here? Do you have a sales forecast to help you plan cash flow? Uh, yeah, um, as far as a, we, we do a, uh, a plan that we update, a monthly sales plan that we update and so forth. Um, what I've done is I plan the cash flow. Years ago, I started planning cash flow on a weekly basis rather than on a monthly basis. Um, uh, I did that when I was first starting out because when you're first starting out, you're just struggling just to make payroll every week. Um, and uh, so what I did is I, I realized, okay, which week I was making paying rent, which week I was paying health insurance, which week I was, I, I could judge my payrolls based on uh, when I was paying sales commissions that the payroll would be a lot higher. Um, my material cost uh, is the biggest thing that has impacted uh, as far as uh, cash from uh, um, uh, cash going out. Um, so using that sales forecast to forecast my materials expense. Um, and then um, looking at how I was going to pay those uh, bills. Yes, you definitely want to be making payments and, and staying, uh, staying uh, current, but really it's all about making regular payments to your vendors um, and, um, and then spreading kind of, I've evened them out in some cases. In some cases uh, I've made, uh, um, I've made arrangements with, with my vendors that rather than uh, me pay all of my invoices, say in um, 30 days um, or 45 days, what I've done is I've said, okay, I'm going to pay um, one sixth of your balance every week. Um, it just uh, smoothed everything out. And then instead of having one week where there may be a, a a $60,000 balance to be paid, and then the next week a $10,000 balance to be paid uh, just based on um, the ebbs and flows of uh, orders being delivered. Um, it just uh, smoothed everything out, which allowed me to, uh, to forecast my cash requirements uh, a lot better. I still maintain those, those, uh, those uh, tools. I don't need to look at them nearly as close uh, on a daily basis, but I maintain them because of issues like uh, what we're going through now, that if there is a cash uh, cash crunch or a, a, I get into a situation, um, I have all that information and I can um, I can go right back to what I was doing as far as managing cash on a weekly basis. Thank you, Fred. So we're basically at time, but Mark, I think you wanted to wrap up. Can you jump on here really quick with some closing remarks? You're muted. There we go. There. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just had one one point and, and I guess you wouldn't expect a tax guy to go the whole time and not bring up income tax. But you know, we're six months in or you should have your June report by now, have an idea how your year's gone and how it may go. So it's a good time to visit with your tax guy in years like this. You may want to take a look at your estimated tax payments so you're not paying too much in. Certainly that would be a leak in the cash flow. Um, there's some opportunities in some recent changes in the tax law. One in particular we've been uh, noticing uh, available for our clients is a longer period for net operating loss carry back. Been able to produce some refunds that get some money back from prior years. And then a, a very popular one, especially in the manufacturing area is search and development credits. Um, I'm, I'm amazed how many times we uh, have new business, a new client, and we talk about that and everyone thinks it's about research and development when in fact, that's what it was for maybe 15 years ago, but anymore it's been widely uh, changed and the name is barely a description of what that credit is actually for and worth an investigation. If you spend a lot of time customizing your products, developing products, anything of that sort. Uh, so, don't forget about income tax. It's um, something we all have to deal with. And if you don't have a tax accountant, you know one now. That's it, Marianne. Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And I think Jake's gonna pop a slide up here with our contact info. You can find any of us on LinkedIn. Um, just look us up, we'll be happy to connect. And it's been an honor to be your moderator today. <laughs> thank you. Uh oh. It's Sideways. <laughs> okay, just find us on LinkedIn. <laughs>
Um, thank you, and we'll see you next time. We have another panel coming August 11th. We'll send you, um, it'll be on LinkedIn, and we will send you an email invite. Thank you all.